back during the uh, Nike customs battle uh, with the American selling price, uh, uh, my friend Rich Werskel, then corporate counsel at Nike, uh, put together like two three ring binders of uh, data and information that he wanted me to peddle on Capitol Hill, which was my job as their lobbyist at the time. And uh, having worked on the Hill, uh, I realized that it was not going to fly, that people don't have time or in the inclination to really read anything more than about a page. Uh, and. Um, but Phil came back one time, and because he was always in a panic because this was so important to the company, he was just frozen in his tracks, and insisted on getting a meeting with Hatfield, and so I set one up, and he and I and Rich went up to Hatfield's office, and I attempted to tell the two of them that uh, what we need to do when we go in there is tell the senator what we'd like him to do for us. Uh, that'll make the meeting a lot, uh, go a lot more quickly. So we went up and uh, before Phil, it was Phil started to give this long background speech about why we were here and, and the senator said, uh, that's okay, I know exactly why you're here. Jay's already briefed me on everything. What do you want me to do? And uh, Rich and Phil are going, well, no, you don't understand. We, you know, it's like we want you to read, you know, 500 pages to understand our dilemma. And he said, uh, well, you know, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to write a letter? Do you want me to call somebody? Do you uh, just say it? And I'll do it if it's within reason. And so, Phil and Rich and I started arguing with each other about what it was that uh, would be the, the right thing to do. So we had to tell the senator, can you just wait a second? And we went to a corner of his office where we thought for 15 or 20 minutes while he was seeing other people on the phone and uh, until we uh, finally came up with the, uh, the notion that he should write a letter to the Secretary of Treasury to, uh, to Put pressure on custom service, but again, it was uh, it was funny at the time because they didn't understand how things worked. Now he was getting quite successful, uh, and after its public offering, some people, a handful of people, became multi multi millionaires, and also they, because of the success, they could bring outsiders in to, and pay them five, 10, 15 times as much as people who have been around for a while. So it's pr probably pretty, probably happens in every corporation that, that becomes a success. That some of the people who were, uh, and I wasn't an original, but I was chapter two of, in Nike's uh, uh, age. Um, you get a little fed up with uh, the changes and, uh, and I was still a young, I was, early 40s, I guess, and although my wife didn't think it was such a good idea, it seemed to me I would, uh, it would be just as good to move on and try something else or, uh, because I, I just didn't, I didn't like what was going on. Having said that, uh, I think I, one morning I went, before work, I uh, grabbed a basketball in the, in the driveway and uh, was saying, after warming up, you know, if this shot goes in, I'm quitting or whatever. And, and uh, I threw up a hook from the corner and uh, it was nothing but net. So I was committed uh, to uh, pulling the trigger and, uh, and I did, I moved on. So, with no place to go, which is pretty stupid, but in uh, a perfectly good job. Yeah, there was a, uh, a Norwegian shot putter, I think, who was on Quaaludes most of the time, but he was uh, uh, Newt Hilton, he's uh, 
a lot of my time I spent internationally, and I, I ended up spending more with a lot of athletes there because I was uh, because I would be on the circuit going from you know one country to the next, and they'd all, all generally haul out their best athletes that they had on the contract. So I, I got to know a bunch, of, and it was, it's nothing like liquor to is the great equalizer. And uh, some of the best, the best athletes in the world uh, know how to roll up their sleeves and, uh, and uh, have an interesting time. Brennan Foster, I mean, a, a number of Olympians, uh, uh, good guys. A javelin thrower from Ireland who, who, who threw up on a bus driver one time <laughs> after a misunderstanding, but uh, yeah, pretty fine. Um, at that time, uh, Rob Strasser had a falling out with uh, with Mr. Knight, and uh, he and Peter Moore had left uh, Nike and were trying to do their own thing. And um, uh, in a group called Sports Inc., and they. They were able to raise money from venture capitalists, uh, and they attempted. They could do. They did some consulting, which they got paid for. A lot of it was Peter's uh, graphic arts design capabilities. They did some stuff for Taylor Made, and that was again in the family because Worstel was there. Uh, and then they tried to launch their own footwear and apparel brand. Van Grack, uh, which it was just surprising that it failed. A couple of white guys uh, trying to lead inner city blacks in in fashion, and uh, uh, and I, I wish I had some of that stuff today. The Matumbo uh, line of clothing was priceless. I mean, it was canvas, uh, zebra uh, toned, and so they were, weren't making any money there, uh, but I, well, Rob asked me to join them, you know, and he was one of the reasons I left Nike, but it was a love-hate deal, and I, that's, so I, but I happily went back, because it was a lot of fun. And uh, for a while, I was selling more Van Grack outside the U.S. than their sales force was selling inside, because it wasn't very good. but. Some of the old contacts internationally would t be willing to take a flyer on uh, uh, that they might hit it again. Although, it, trying to explain the Van Grack line to uh, these people that we had dealt with with Nike years before, it was difficult to keep a straight face. I think. Um, so I ended up with uh, Sports Inc. and Rob at the time. Uh, Adidas, uh, Adidas was in our herd locker in the in the U.S. They had uh, their their annual sales in the U.S. had fallen to about two hundred million bucks, which wasn't very much. Um, so they were looking for new management, and uh, there had been a bunch of people that always seemed to take advantage of Adidas o over here. And and it, the Germans would pop in and think that they could run it, and they wouldn't, so they'd hire some Americans, and the Americans would fleece them and rob them blind, and then they'd go away, and then they'd come back. But at the time, Peter Ubroth's uh, group, uh, Contrarian, I think, had the, uh, was managing Adidas USA. And this was about 1990-91. Uberoff had made a big name for himself in the uh, LA Olympics. Um, but his contract was coming to an end, and uh, it, it gets pretty complicated what was going on. But there was a Frenchman, Bernard Tepe, who was a cabinet minister, who was a thief, and he wanted uh, in, he wanted Adidas to himself. Uh, there was the gentleman who had funded Reebok. I can't think of his name. I'm 
silver haired guy and he wanted it and there were I mean the people were crawling out of the walls. And Rob and Owen went over to Germany for uh, almost a year uh, pitching uh, you know, consulting about how how the shoe company ought to be run in the US. And part of that was with Peter's input, developing the equipment line, which was their initial main theme that uh, Adidas should have these core products. And, uh, but ultimately, then Rob and Peter became part of the competition to see who would be in charge, although they certainly could not take over globally uh, Adidas. But that then ended up, uh, end up falling to uh, uh, Robert Dreyfus, Louis Dreyfus, uh, a guy, I don't know if you want to go into this, but he was, certainly the Dreyfus family had lots of money from commodities and he himself had done extraordinarily well as the head of Saatchi and Saatchi, one of the world's largest ad agencies, and, and he had his own company that made him millions also. So and he was, he was our age, he's uh, now since gone to his reward, but uh, he was a young guy with Harvard Business School. Uh, and he leveraged the acquisition of uh, Adidas Germany, or Adidas Worldwide. And in that package, he had uh, to do something with America. And he bought into Strasser's argument uh, Strasser had a management agreement for a group of us to uh, that Robert had to purchase before he could truly go public. Yes, uh, Adidas had been a privately held company all those years, and so there was some money in the in the in the game, uh, but. Ultimately, when everybody else fell out, Tape and uh, uh, whatever, we ended up, well, Dreyfus ended up with the company and we ended up with the U.S. for a period of time. And uh, that's how it happened. The Adidas was jammed, there were no old people there. It was jam-packed with 20-year-olds 20, 20 and 30-year-olds, I guess. Uh, being in my 40s, was I was like a grandfather at the time. But there were a lot of kids really right out of college, I think, or just a year or two out. And uh, uh, the enthusiasm ran high. You know, you don't have to pay them very much. They like being there. And it, generally, the old adage was you just roll a keg out and maybe print some free t-shirts. And that would keep them going for another uh, several months. But when I get to MC the uh, Robbies, uh, I mean, the last year I did it, I were in Lederhosen. <laughs> I always get kind of shit faced before uh, I, I, I took on the, the Jerry's a little more than I should have, possibly. With the, uh, uh, but I had some great bits about Strasser. There was a guy, Franklin, somebody or other, who would do a visuals for me, and uh, we had Rob's face on uh, on Audi Dossler several times, and so I would we'd be telling the, the Strasser story, but it would be using other people's bodies, and uh, uh, and I had him on like Armin Hari's face, you know, in that fa in the, the famed German spreader. And he said, he was wedged into lanes three, four, and five. I mean, at Rob, Lark, uh, and, and, and ended up having his face on Wilma Rudolph, his, his greatest achievement. Uh, well, my tenure as the head of sports marketing at Adidas, I'm not certain I brought much sense to it. That my predecessor had had, uh, had spent all the money uh, in his budget and for and my budget and for a couple of years to come. They, they, they virtually obligated all the funds, so there was 
by the time I got the job, there, there wasn't much room for any new initiatives. It was mostly trying to uh, extract ourselves from some of the uh, some of the mistakes that we may have uh, agreed to pay for. And uh, in that regard, I mean, it was, uh, I was very much impressed. I hadn't dealt with, other than on a friendship basis or social basis, with a lot of the people in the promotions department. But I was very surprised at how actually professional the, our group was. Even many of them were still fairly young. Yeah, I think we got it back on, a little bit better back on track so that they would have some room to maneuver in the future. Uh, again, my predecessor had the slot spending like a sailor and, uh, and with not much really to show for it, I think. I mean, the, the, the money was getting pretty big. It's, it's bigger than that today, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's an impure science, I think. I, uh, it, uh, another job I had at, at, at Edis was, and again, uh, it was nothing that I was seeking out, but, uh, but I happened to be in the wrong place at the right time, and uh, at Edis, it was contemplating getting into the retail side of the business. They, forever they'd been a wholesaler, and, uh, but Outlet malls were becoming de rigor in parts of the country, and uh, and this was a good liquidation play to control your own inventory as opposed to selling everything off to TJ Maxx or uh, ugly downstairs gray market trans shippers or wherever this stuff went. If you make a, made a mistake in your inventories and had to get rid of it. Uh, the idea was very appealing of selling it through your own outlet stores and maintaining some control and pricing. So, so I inherited the uh, Adidas retail outlets and uh, it was really a lot of fun actually. Uh, we, uh, we probably built about in no more than about two years, we probably built close to 40 stores. I think there were about three in existence when I took over, and they were uh, very, they were like cardboard. Uh, it, it, there were many, many problems associated with, here you have this iconic brand, and yet you're selling trash, so uh, how do you present it, you know, do you, with the flourish and neon of a, of a successful brand, or do you just downplay it and put it on racks or somewhere that you control? Uh, and we were struggling with that all the time. We were also struggling against our sales, our own sales force, who loathed the idea of Adidas getting into retail because it took money from their children's mouths, and because uh, they wouldn't get the sales commission on, on uh, anything that was sold, um, uh, territorialism, it, it, it was interesting. But we, we, again, building up to uh, 40 stores, I have no idea how many they have today, probably 150, I don't know. Although the outlet phenomena kind of died down, I think they, uh, have transitioned into inline stores, flagship stores. Um, the problem there being you've got to compete against your major accounts in terms of holding price. And, and uh, uh, but I, I guess again, Nike did it very successfully with Nike Towns, and I think they must have three or four tiers practically now of different uh, retail. Uh, distribution channels of their own. Uh, but I, I enjoyed the ARO phenomenon. Uh, Lendl Smith uh, was actually an old shoe dog. He'd been in the, working in a running athletic run. He was a good runner and he, he worked in, he knew his shoes. And I don't know how I 
got him. I got him as a buyer in the, for the retail outlets, and he became a trusted uh, uh, operative in our organization. And I, we had we had some good folks. We also always played. I always played the hand I was dealt. Uh, I don't think I ever went out and sought somebody from the outside. Uh, to try and promote from within as best as we could, and I was never truly disappointed. I mean, given the opportunities, 99% uh, of the people that ever worked for me always stepped up and, uh, and uh, improved their performance. Well, I don't miss the management meetings that much. Uh, I, I miss the I miss the camaraderie of uh, you know, walking through the building, and I walk down to Aero and say, you know, have you had enough leadership today? And uh, they'd all give me the nod, and I could turn around and go back to my office. Uh, yeah, there was there were some very nice people, and uh, and what the heck? During our tenure. Uh, we made a lot of money for people. It was a success. It wasn't a, we weren't riding a flat line at all. We, uh, there's a reason you take, go to 40 stores. It's because you're making money. And you're, it, um, yeah, and Adidas kind of topped out. I, I don't know what, it, I don't even know what the sales figures are. Once you walk away, you know, I don't look back that much, but we took it from 200 million to about a billion two, I think at least. And uh, we had, remember, the, you, as you recall, the uh, you helped out with the billion dollar bubbly, uh, which I thought was kind of cool. I mean, who gives a bottle of champagne to their to everybody uh, when you reach a, a certain goal? Uh, I think efforts to, uh, uh, to duplicate that, you know, with baseball bats and everything, it's not the same. But uh, um, yeah, it was it was a fun place to work. Uh, you felt you weren't guilty because you were definitely pulling your own, or you were making money for the shareholders, and you, uh, that, that's all positive vibes. Uh, I think people that took it too seriously, because remember, it was it was just shoes, and uh, I wish we'd been trying to cure cancer at the time. We made some headway, but uh, yeah, I mean, some of the top management would get very self-important and uh, take it much too seriously. I think, uh, and. I don't like trade shows. I don't think anymore. <laughs> I've got I've attended my last trade show. That's pretty boring. Uh, well, you're always in get a little bit of disbelief. You don't. It does. It, it, there's a point that it just kind of smacks you. You say, "Well, God, this, uh, they're not kidding this time." But uh, but I, I'm still not quite certain what it's all about, even though. Uh, Right now, I'm looking for a clinical trial, which suggests that the, the uh, uh, standard forms of uh, treatment aren't working. So, so we're going for the Hail Mary. But, the, but interestingly, there's so much new in the, in the field that uh, I'm trying to get into something uh, in the immunotherapy side of things, which is fairly new. It's, tricking your own immune system into fighting the cancer cells, which it sh they should be doing, but they, for some reason they don't. And that's been very successful uh, in, with melanoma and lung cancer, and, uh, and they have hopes for, uh, you know, I, I'm certain someday they won't, they probably won't be cancer. They'll just, uh, they will have figured it out. Yeah, because uh, you don't know quite when the terminus is, and still, I think that 
you go from, I go like in three or four month period, chunks of time waiting for the next measurement to say how I'm doing. And when those don't pan out successfully, then you think, fuck, I've just wasted uh, three or four months. And uh, so if, if they could tell you, then you could put together a plan. I, I would hate to just fizzle away, but I don't think that's going to happen. 